Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our third uh, in the webinar series of the history of medicine. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Uh, our speaker is well known to you, and that's Professor John Flood, who is Professor and Chairman of the Department of Medicine at RCSI Bahrain. Professor Flood has an extensive and consummate and passionate experience of matters historical as they relate to medicine, as they relate to Renaissance art, medieval architecture and the classics. He has a variety of master's uh, degrees in all of these areas, and I'm sure that you will all be entertained by his, uh, by his uh, presentation today. Before we get to that, some housekeeping issues. Next slide, please. Uh, our session today will be moderated by Professor Gabriel Fox, and our topic for today is the anatomical dissection and the history of anatomy. And without further ado, uh, I turn you over to the very capable hands of Professor John Flood. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to the third lecture in our Histori History of Medicine series from the RCSI in Bahrain, as Martin, Professor Martin Cobley has introduced uh, today. Um, the, I'm going to start off as usual with a quotation. A, a, a quotation from a person you've never heard of, um, but I like his quotation. He was Marcus Garvey was a Jamaican political activist in the early 20th century. And he once said, a, a, a people without a knowledge of their past history, origins and culture is like a tree without roots. And there's no doubt about it that no other subject on the medical curriculum defines uh, doctors more than the study of anatomy and dissection. And as doctors and anatomists, we've been doing this now for 2,500 years. It is what separates us from the humanities and these, these sciences. Um, the delivery of a, the history of anatomy in one hour is a daunting task. It is just impossible. It would take the whole series of lectures to get through each block of development in history of uh, anatomy from the early Egyptian times, uh, the, it was Greek Ptolemy time, the Greek Ptolemaic times of Egyptian history right down to uh, early 20th century. I have left out the 20th century because it would be into the realm of um, scientific advances and so on. And that would be an almost topic on its own. So I'm going to start off with a very simple and entertaining slide and then I will start the lecture. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so today the topic is the history of anatomy. It spans 2,500 years. During that period of 2,500 years, of course, there wasn't continual evolution uh, in the and, in, and uh, acquisition of anatomical knowledge. It was a huge hiatus of about 1,000 years, 1,400 years probably, where very little happened for a large number of different reasons. Uh, historically, uh, the church in, got involved and started uh, uh, regulating uh, who and who could not do dissection, who could provide medical care. Uh, the conquest of North Africa, especially of Egypt, by Islam, by the Islamic forces, of course, um, stopped dissection and anatomical studies in Egypt, and particularly in Alexandria. And there are lots of other reasons. It started off again for, uh, in the 13th and 14th century, and then gradually between uh, the 13th and 14th century and the uh, first part of the 20th century, with a massive uh, development in anatomical knowledge. But be aware, it wasn't just a question of the acquisition of knowledge in anatomy. Anatomy, um, the study of anatomy had far more social impact than you can imagine. It was a vital subject for uh, academic studies, for philosophical development, philosophical ideas. People saw it as a social status. Doctors in America went from being small town uh, faith healers, if that's the word I would use, um, to uh, 
qualified uh, doctors who studied anatomy and, and had rudimentary skills in surgery and medicine. Uh, it was seen uh, as a way of social advancement that the respectable people with education had texts of anatomy in their houses and got them printed. They attended dissections and in particularly in Italy, anatomy had an anatomical dissection had a completely different role than you would imagine uh, studying it in, in, in uh, studying from textbooks. It had uh, it was part of Carnavale, which is the only residual um, uh, evidence we have of that. It's called Carnavale in Venice, but Carnavale, which is held in January and February, was a very important social event in Italian and culture. And, and anatomical dissection, public anatomical dissections were a very, very important part of that. And we will look at um, how the social impact of that. Next slide, please. Now, normally when you're a historian and you talk about history, you talk about oh, you know, the Napoleonic Wars the influence of Britain in Europe, which, which now is gone, sadly. The uh, impact Britain had on, you know, on, on, the on the conquering of the Nazi forces in Europe and so on and so forth. And, and, and these are the topics that people get grossly involved in as, as historians. But I, uh, as a historian, have a different approach to, to the whole topic. And I like this uh, concept of micro history. And micro history uh, is the study of history, not in in villages, in a, in a specific village, but in villages rather than in parliaments or big, big palaces where the uh, power uh, was power and influence in society in the Middle Ages in particular was, was located. So macro history, is a, it takes a long, it's the, what we call the, the, the grand jurés, the long history of events that occur in, 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 in historical in history. It's about multiple society of nations interacting to influence each other. Uh, it, it talked that the historians talk about far reaching outcomes, historical passions and repeated historical processes. And then, of course, when the historians are, uh, you know, summarizing either their book or their lecture, they give uh, overarching confusion conclusions. A very, um, uh, Ho, Ho Chi Minh was asked after the, uh, you know, the whole mess that occurred in Far East with the, the onset of communism, which destroyed Chinese culture. He was asked, um, what influence do you think China, uh, communism will have on Chinese civilization? And this is, uh, you know, uh, a number, a good number of years after the Chinese, con the communist conquest of China. And he said, it is far, far too, far, far too soon to say. So the Chinese concept of history is in huge, long periods of time. In, in the West, we have a different approach. We talk about uh, micro events or, or shorter histories like the two world wars, which uh, caused enormous upheaval in Europe. So what is micro history? So uh, let me just get down to the next slide and I'll tell you what micro history is and how it will, how you look at hi historic, how you look at anatomical, uh, the study of anatomy using it, the micro historical approach. So I first came across um, uh, this man called Carlo Ginzburg. Uh, he's an Italian and um, I first came across him because I had to give a lecture on micro history to the Area Modern History Society at the University of London 2017. And in my preparation, uh, for the talk, uh, which was like today, an hour and so on, to uh, an audience who were uh, equally as interested. Uh, I had to research this man. Now, he is an amazing character. He, and I've actually heard him talking. He, um, he, he, is, uh, he, quite, he was born in Turin in 1939 and he did his PhD in Pisa in, in 61. And then he was subsequently taught, of course, obviously initially at the University of Bologna, uh, and then, of course, went to the States. The Americans, of course, having uh, far more money than most European universities uh, tempted him over to America with a large salary. And um, he, he, uh, his initial work was on the persecution of witches in early modern Europe. And he came up when he was doing this, uh, they're called the, ban they, they're called the Bandanti, B-A-N-D-A-N-T-I. And it was a, a vision, it was, a, he also looked at folk traditions in 16th, 17th century, Friuli in northeastern Italy, which is up towards, uh, Trieste, where you Joyce lived for quite a while. And while he was doing his research, uh, and he was one of the few historians who had access to the Vatican Library and Vatican Archives, while he was doing it, he came across the report um, of uh, a poor old miller called uh, Menaccio, who lived between 1532 and 1599. Uh, and he, 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 what he came across was, were two reports of his trials, he had two separate trials for heresy, and eventually he was executed. And he was executed because he caused so much social disruption in Friuli. And um, so he then came along and, um, uh, and published a number of papers on and a book. So Nathan, can you go to the next slide, please? 
next, next slide, please. No. Okay, so th he came along then and he, he published a book based on his studies, which he came to 10 years after his initial work. And um, the book is called um, uh, The Cheese and Worms. And uh, the, the, the description of the book comes from the mess of the uh, imagery that the, um, uh, the poor old uh, Dominicio Scandela, the, the um, miller, the imagery he used to explain the cosmos uh, to uh, member of to the people in the village uh, that he lived in. So the Italian name for it is Il Formaggio e il Verme, and um, he described the world as being cheese and all the angels and gods and the devils as being worms. And this was a description he used based on his readings. And the interesting thing about him was that he was literate. He, uh, he attended one of the local schools which had been founded in the uh, town of Friuli. Uh, we don't have any books available uh, that he actually was taught, they were used to teach him in school, but we do have a list of books that were found in his house when he was actually arrested for heresy in the village uh, and put on trial. And uh, the books were very commonly found in Europe at that time and commonly passed around. But he had things like um, the Travels of Sir John Mandeville, which is a medieval text from England. He had Decameron's uh, by Boccaccio's uh, Decameron. He had even an Italian translation of the Koran. And he had some religious texts, uh, Ilusadio della Madonna by a Dominican Alberto de Castello. So this man was no fool. And um, he, he, um, he had this image of the creation of the cosmos in his head that he display, explained to all the farmers that came along to get their grain milled in Friuli. But the problem was that the local church didn't like it, neither did the bishop, and certainly the local um, uh, uh, aristocracy didn't like it because they were worried about dissent and revolution and so on. So he was tried at the beginning and he um, he was told to uh, stop to proselytizing heresy and he did for a while but he was such an articulate man that he started off again and eventually he was tried a second time and executed. Now what's the relevance of that to um, our talk today? Well this, these two books, The Return of Martin Gare, which is a very famous book about a man who uh, pretends he's Martin Gerkham after the Hundred Years' War and is eventually also executed for, uh, for, uh, in, for being an imposter. These are two books that, that look at micro events in, in European history. And that's what we're going to do today. We can't look at the history of anatomy since uh, Egyptian times in fine detail. In fine detail, one sequence, sequential event after the other. It is impossible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a microhistorical approach. And what we're going to do is we're going to take on a journey. And our journey will take us from 2,500 years, over 2,500 year period, from uh, Ptolemaic Egypt. As you know, Egypt was conquered by the Greeks and then by the Romans, where it became part of the Roman Empire. But the Greeks were there for several hundred years, 700 years, and there were 13 Ptolemies and seven Cleopatras. And Ptolemy was one of four generals, part of Alexander's conquering army. And he stayed in, uh, in, 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 in Egypt and became uh, and became the first uh, Ptolemaic emperor, Ptolemaic Sotar, and the next guy was called Ptolemaic Philadelphus. Now, it, it, you may say, well, of course, there was an anatomical dissection before Egyptian times. Sure, there was, but this is the first time this is that we have really historical written evidence, indirectly, I have to say, not directly from uh, uh, the Ptolemaic Egypt of the time, but it comes indirectly by other people uh, re relaying the information through their own writings down through history. And uh, the first place that all of this happened was in Alexandria, a city founded on the Delta by uh, Alexander the Great himself. Next slide, Neville, please. OK, so before, yeah, so this shows you basically some of the texts that I've referred to microhistory. And you can see Ginsburg's name is on the first two at the top. Next slide, please. OK, so now we are starting our journey. Um, uh, uh, we're starting our journey from uh, from Egypt. And um, uh, as I said, there, there is probably some evidence that um, uh, anatomical dissection, there is some evidence that anatomical dissection took place, for example, in, in uh, the Sassanid Empire, which is now Asia, in Asia Minor. But the real documented evidence really comes initially from Alexandria. And we had two anatomists there, Erastostratus and Herophilus. And um, uh, where did the anatomical dissection or where did it all happen? Well, in Alexandria at that time, uh, Tol uh, Ptolemy Sotar and Ptolemy Philadelphus, the two first Ptolemies, founded the library, the museum 
the infamous library of, Ale of Alexandria, which of course was eventually destroyed, not as people have accused uh, the, the, the Islamic invasions of Dringa, but it probably got destroyed uh, in different, at different stages through its history by neglect. And there were several fires. Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus was a very erudite man, and he uh, basically uh, wanted uh, copies of every single text that was written in the, known, uh, civil, in, the, in the known world at that time. And they were in scrolls in the Great Library in Alexandria. Next slide, please. Nathan. And this is, uh, again, a diagrammatic representation of what the scrolls may have looked like inside in the... Um, in the library and the museum. Now, this wasn't a university in the modern sense. It was a place where people went and uh, and learned to write philosophy, learned uh, to become doctors and so on. There were, of course, doctors of great infamy uh, before this, like Hippocrates of Kos on the island of Kos uh, was, is one and so on. And even um, uh, Greek philosophers like um, uh, Greek philosophers like Aristotle, Plato and Empedocles. We know, for example, that um, Aristotle dissected animals, but he didn't um, He didn't basically formally dissect any humans. And the first two people to do that were Herophilus of Alexandria and, and, uh, and uh, his, um, his assistant. Next slide, please. Okay, so we, so I've got to summarise here what, um, uh, what Her Herophilus did or achieved um, in uh, the museum and the library at Alexandria. Um, now, he was born in Asia Minor. Lots, lots of the Asia Minor was a very populated, because it's present in Turkey, a very populated part of the um, Greek world and of the Roman Empire eventually, and the Byzantine uh, a number of years later when Byzantium uh, became the Eastern Roman Empire. And he was born there in a place called Chalcedon, which is in present day Turkey. And he was trained by a number of physicians there, like Crispus of Snido and so on. When he moved to Alexandria in the third century BC, so we're right back uh, before Christ. 300 years before Christ. When he got there, he and uh, Erastostratus started doing human dissections. And, and they did this because um, Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus allowed criminals to be dissected uh, as part of their punishment. I don't think he had a philosophical reason for doing it, but he was a man of uh, great learning and he wanted to the human body to be investigated by dissection. Um, and this uh, basically uh, is where anatomical dissection started. So how much did Herophilus and Erastus contribute to anatomic knowledge? A huge amount. They were the first ones to describe a large number of anatomical structures, and I'm going to just read out a number of them to you. So for example, he, um, Herophilus, we start off Herophilus, he was able to distinguish between vessels and nerves. Now this is all before microscopes, and this is all just crude dissection using just daylight. So he was able to show that veins and arteries were different from nerves. He was able to show um, the difference between motor and sensory fibres. He defined and uh, named the first seven cranial nerves. He described the duodenum uh, and he, he used the word uh, deca, to carry on or tylon to describe the duodenum, which means 12 fingers in breadth. Uh, he described the male and female reproductive organs. And um, then Erastostratus, his assistant, uh, described the ventricles of the brain, the differentiated the cerebellum from the cortex, uh, describe the cerebral aqueduct and so on. So, uh, and on top of all that, Erastratus, who lived longer than uh, Herophilus, he then went along and dissected the heart and, put, and described the, um, the basically uh, the, the fact that the heart works the pump. He described the valves. And more importantly, to contradict all the Greek philosophers beforehand, uh, they showed that the pulse did not come from an innate pulsatility in the artery, that it came from the heart. And this was a major shift in thinking. Um, they both contributed to huge amounts. And as a matter of fact, the confluence of the, of the venous sinuses in the head is, um, is called torcula herophili, which, which is where the straight sinus and the sagittal sinus meet at the back of your head, uh, in your, where your occipital bone is. That's was again described by him. So that's where the whole, that's where the whole story starts. It starts in, in Greek, uh, Ptolemy, uh, Greece. Greek, uh, it starts basically in Egypt under the influence of the, of the Greek culture and Greek civilization. We then move on to the next uh, great anatomist before things really um, deteriorate and, and there's no basically anatomical dissection for over a thousand years. And that's to Galen. So next slide, please. Um, now Galen, uh, <laughs> Galen is a, a, an enormously important figure in the study of anatomy and he's also contributed to an enormous amount of uh, inaccuracies, I have to say. Okay, he was a very, uh, a very, uh, forceful man, a great writer. He wrote over five or 600 different uh, descriptions of uh, anatomical structures. He um, did all his anatomical dissection though on animals. And that's where the problem started. 
So what he did was he uh, took the known knowledge from uh, Egypt at the time and the writings of Hippocrates and he developed them. And he started like uh, he started to wrote a treatise on the pulse and and the amount of stuff he wrote if you work out how long he lived it, he must have been writing every day so there is a suspicion that lots of his writings actually uh, come from other people and they just happen to be under the, the great cape of uh, claudius galen's writings now he's a number he's a long time after he's tried he's um 600 years he's three he's 500 years after our previous anatomists he is a very important figure in his in uh uh, Roman political life because he was not he was a he was the um, physician to Marcus Aurelius a very very important uh, Roman emperor who wrote meditations he was a brilliant philosopher and if any of you were glad or saw gladiator the film Commodus was Marcus Aurelius' son and Marcus Aurelius was uh, spent most of his life on the northern empire fighting the Gauls uh, and uh, up there is where he wrote um, his uh, famous uh, meditations I wouldn't have blamed him I'm sure the Gaul winter was pretty cold if they get stupid right text like that. What did Galen do? He also, Galen got his knowledge from looking after the um, uh, the gladiators in the arena. So gladiators would get injured, they get abdominal wounds, they get thigh wounds, they would get uh, fingers chopped off and so on. And this is where he started seeing male and human anatomy. And um, and and I, where we know that, for example, he did not do any, any, any anatomical dissection. So his knowledge had to come from his animal work and also from what he identified in the battlefield of the other of the Roman arena. Um, he did identify things like if you cut the spinal cord across the middle, the legs, the, the limbs would no longer work. He tied the recurrent laryngeal nerve in, in pigs, for example, and showed that they squeal, didn't squeal anymore. And um, for any of you studied anatomy, there is, um, uh, there is a connection between the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal nerve, which is called Ansegalini. And of course, he described this. And this is where that name comes from. He, as I said, he also wrote over 500 papers and the the the, uh, the opinion of nowadays is that he probably didn't write all of it. Um, so this is where huge advances were made by this particular man. But this is where things got really, uh, uh, this is where things got, uh, just didn't work very well. Because the next thousand years of medical practice is influenced by this man. And there was a huge amount of inaccuracies in his anatomical descriptions and even in his physiology. And it took enormous conflict in right down to the Renaissance period between Vesalius and other anatomists before people realized how incorrect he was in his descriptions and that most of his work or all of his work was done on animals. And of course, animals have different anatomy uh, from, from primates, uh, undulates, for example. So one of the things he did was he dissected a cattle and in undulates, does there anastomosis at the base of the brain called the rita mirabilis, which he described as being present in everybody. And of course, everybody from there on, uh, Bernard de Capri in the Middle Ages, was looking for this structure and it didn't exist in humans. And this is the first hint to Vesalius that this man really was not talking about human dissection, human anatomy at all. That brings us on to the next phase, which is the Middle Ages. And that's the next slide, please. Okay, so that's all very well. We're in the uh, second century AD, advances have been made and then things start to deteriorate. Why? Because the church got involved. So over the next three or 400 years, 500 years, uh, as we come into the early Middle Ages, 7th, 8th, 9th century and the late Middle Ages, things deteriorate. There's been no anatomical dissection done really until we get to the 13th and 14th century. And all the knowledge uh, that, that, that was there and used by anatomists and, and uh, professors and in, acad in academic, uh, by, by anatomists and by doctors practicing and, and so on, was based on Galen's work, which was uh, not, as you know, not uh, correct. The Middle Ages come along and things start to change. So what changes? Well, the church gets involved for a start and then universities start to be founded. So for example, um, the 11th and 12th century uh, was a time when there was an assist, when we had the establishment of a large number of universities in Europe. Bologna was founded in 1088, Paris in 1150, Oxford in 1167, and Padua in 1222. So we have institutions in which, uh, you know, philosophy, rhetoric uh, is taught, and also medicine is taught as well. But the medicine practiced in the Middle Ages and even further down to the 17th, 18th century is not medicine based in university studies. The physicians who studied medicine in Oxford and Cambridge and all these academic institutions were philosophers. They didn't have the barber and surgeon approach to practical and uh, practical um, 
the practical problems people had every day of injuries, infections, um, uh, trauma, spinal injuries, and so on and so forth. They had no practical knowledge. They would just go and philosophize uh, to these people's houses. So you're in there with your broken leg and some daft Oxford graduate who's a doctor comes in and starts reading philosophy to you. I think you would certainly throw them out fairly quickly out of your house. And this is where they, this, the, in the villages where the, the bone setters and the faith healers uh, started to uh, to to uh, get prominence and get and and subserve the function of practical medicine in everyday life and not philosophy. That was the practical practical aspect of it. What happened with the church was the church then stopped the monks from being involved in hospitals. So as I told you last week, uh, Saint Bartholomew's and Saint Thomas's hospitals are August were Augustinian institutions until. Pope Alexander III in 1105 to 1181 came along and said that the church were no longer to get involved in the provision of medical care and certainly not dissection. So that was the end of that. They got, they stopped looking after patients in their big, big monasteries like uh, St. Thomas and St. Barthes. And on top of all that, uh, another Pope, uh, Boniface VII, came along and he slightly modified things by saying, OK, you can dissect for for." Or for autopsy reasons to see why somebody died. But he was uh, very much against the practice of the Crusaders who would fight, go over to fight in the Levant, and then some of them would die, and they would basically be, uh, organs would be removed, the bones would be boiled down, and the whole thing would shift back to Europe. And uh, particularly if they were kings, the heart went to one place, the bones went to somewhere else. And this uh, practice he wanted to stop. He didn't actually stop dissection as such. And he wrote an encyclical or papal bull called the Sepulchris to stop this. So here we are in the Middle Ages with universities are coming along with academic environments being created and with the church in being involved, stopping priests and monks providing medical care and also uh, dissection not occurring uh, because the, uh, there were religious reasons and there were also political reasons for this uh, to happen. But it got better. With the development of the universities, we have what we call the pre part of anatomic, the advances in anatomical studies, where we are looking at what happened to an anatomical studies and dissection before Vesalius uh, came along and revolutionized the whole thing. And that brings us above all places to Italy. Uh, in Italy, we have all these wonderful universities. We've got Pavia, Bologna, Pisa and so on. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of students around, wonderful discursive academic environments. And it was in this environment that anatomical dissection took place again. And the man credited with that is, um, is uh, Mondaina de Luzzi from Bologna. And uh, in the text, it says one of the great milestones for anatomists must have been the public pedagogic dissection by Mondaina de Luzzi in 1315. He was an Italian physician, anatomist, and professor of surgery at Bologna, and he's often called the restorer of anatomy. So we're back on track again to anatomical dissection and the scientific study of the body. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, still wasn't right. The professor of medicine and professor of surgery in those days did not do dissection. He was a philosopher. He got up on a nice big podium. I'll show you love some examples for, uh, of the podiums from Bologna uh, anatomical uh, dissection uh, room, which is still in existence and is a wonderful place to visit. The one in Pavia is even better. And he would just there, he would philosophize about, oh, the center of the consciousness, where they, what the function of the heart was, but he would never touch the body. And you see in this particular uh, slide, uh, you have a butcher and he's called the pro sector. And the guy on the left looks like his assistant, but you always had another guy called the ostensor who pointed out the different organs that the butcher or the pro sector had actually identified. And the professor of anatomy then was the lector. He never touched the body. He never even looked at it. He just proselytized from his chair. And that was how anatomical studies were done. The Middle Ages. It was all Galenic. It was all based on the studies that Galen and all the, the incorrect anatomy that Galen described was transmitted down for another four, three or four hundred years. And this is what brought in anatomical studies way back. Now, I could keep going on about what went on in the Middle Ages. There are a large number of anatomists involved, but I think that gives you a flavor of what uh, was going on in the Middle Ages. Things changed. Let's next slide. Um, what changed? The Renaissance came along. Renaissance came along, and the, this was uh, a renaissance of uh, philosophy, ideas, art, 
uh, uh, um, styles in sculpture, styles in drawing, styles in representation that come from the Greek world. It was a renaissance of Greek ideas and, Ro and, and Roman ideas from the classical world. So we have, it's, it was, there's a word described called the Dark Age. It's not quite right. There was academic activity down between the fall of the Roman Empire and the early, early and uh, the 14th century. But it wasn't as vigorous as you had in there initially. Italy was the great centre of intellectual life, of development of in, in art, literature, sculpture, and so on. And and the the Italians in those times copied the classical world, as did this eminent man here, Vesalius. He wasn't Italian; he was actually uh, Flemish. But he is the most important figure in the study of anatomy that anybody else in two and a half thousand years. And he had a very eminent career and a very disappointing career. He was very badly treated by his colleagues, not an unusual occurrence in modern day uh, clinical practice as well. But he in particular was victimized and vilified by other anatomists and so on. And he eventually left an, uh, his chair in, in, in Padua and became the personal physician of uh, Charles V, the great Holy Roman Emperor. What's his background? Uh, his background is amazing. His great grandfather was a physician. His grandfather was a physician. They went to the University of Louvain. His father was an apothecary and eventually became uh, the uh, valet de chambre to Charles V. And when he did that, um, uh, Vesalius decided to change career. So Vesalius initially went uh, to the University of Louvain and then uh, did in 1528 and did an arts degree. Good education. His father then became uh, the valet de chambre uh, to Charles V. And when he did that, uh, uh, Vesalius changed his mind and he went to study in, uh, medicine. To do that, Paris was the great place to do it. There were, um, uh, there were medical schools in other places. For example, Salerno is very eminent, Bologna, Padua, Montpellier and Paris. But he went to Paris. But what happened then was Henry III of France, Charles V, had a big bust up. War broke out and he, uh, being uh, Spanish, because of course the Netherlands were, the Spanish Netherlands were part of the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, Portugal, the Spanish Netherlands, and so on. He, being of that uh, uh, political background, had to leave Paris, and he went to um, uh, he went to 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 uh, back to Louvain and qualified as a doctor, and um, in, that was in 1536. When he qualified as a doctor at the age of 24. Uh, he then uh, was offered the, he got top of his class, first class, well, what would you correspond to today as first class honours? He became uh, sought after by a large number of rich royal families like the Medici and so on. But eventually he was offered the chair of anatomy and surgery at the University of Padua at the age of 24. And when he got to Padua, uh, he decided uh, to not concentrate on surgery in the hospital in Padua, but to actually concentrate on anatomy. So he started teaching um, the medical students in the university and he gets the bodies out. The bodies were usually of criminals who were executed. The rules were that the, you, they would, you could uh, um, use bodies of executed criminals, but the people executed had to be within out, 30 miles outside Bologna. So there were not people in the local community, so the students wouldn't recognize them. And um, so he started dissecting and teaching anatomy and used Galen's ideas. And when he was doing this, so he, instead of getting a prosector or um, a yeah, prosector to do it, like the local butcher uh, or like the local barber surgeon, he himself did it. And then he realized that Galen was completely wrong. For example, there was no retum malabilis in the head. The jaw uh, bone, the mandible did not have two parts. The liver did not have six lobes like in a pig. And then the penny dropped that this was all Galen stuff. It's just not rubbish, but certainly highly incorrect. So he himself started doing anatomical dissection. Now, he then wrote a book called the physical Atta, which we look at in a minute. But how did the physical Atta come about? Well, he started teaching students how to do phlebotomy, to bloodlet, because the treatment in those days for illness was to let, let the blood, uh, to, um, to cup somebody and then to, to phlebotomy and bloodletting. The students had to be taught where to take the blood from. And Galen says, you've got to take it from where the area of damage is, where the area of infection is. But he said, no, you don't. I'll show you where you could do it. And he started to draw them. And then eventually the students started to take these drawings and copy them and bring them home with them as part of their study. Then he, then he, then they started asking him for more and he came up then with six drawings and he, in 1538 and he called it the tabula and atomic uh, six, six being six. And they were, through, they were, they consist of, an, of arteries, veins, bones, muscles and so on and so forth. Um, 1541, he was really on, uh, quite uh, focused on 
uh, doing things a, a bit better. So he then started to put together uh, a book. Uh, and a, the final copy of the uh, book that he actually put together is called The Humani Corporis Fabrica, eventually published in 1543. And it is in seven books. Uh, the first book is of bones and cartilage, ligaments and muscle, veins, arteries, organs of nutrition, heart and associated organs. And, and this, in book seven, he uses he, for the brain. The brain he did wasn't very good at. He copied Galen. So the first six uh, books were all basically uh, his original conceptions. He himself did not do the drawings. Jean de Calcar, who was a pupil of Titian's in Venice, um, basically did the drawings. And it's the drawings that are quite magnetic when you look at them. Next slide, please. OK, this is the introductory page to uh, the Humani Corpus Fabrica, the most in impact, the book with the greatest impact on anatomical knowledge in uh, two millennia. What's interesting about it is, number one, this was a man who defied convention. We have a woman, breasts, abdomen open to the public. This is this defies uh, normal customs, normal manners of the time, and especially the dissection of a woman. Any anatomical representation of the female genitalia was frowned upon, even in the Renaissance Italy. He goes along and he dissects a woman in front of everybody. Now, how impactful was enormous, enormous. The place is full of students. This is an unusual event. The students came along in rows to see uh, live anatomical dissections. Bernardo de Capri, for example, once, he was a, his predecessor as a professor, but he was in Bologna. He at once dissected the placenta of a woman that had been executed. He had 500 university medical students standing around with him, standing around him, and people from the local town. Uh, from, from Bologna, looking at what a placenta looked like. This was the impact that anatomical dissection had on people's minds and people's conversations in the, in the Renaissance period. This was like uh, space travel, computers in the 21st, 2021st century. He uses a classical environment. These are Corinthian columns, so he's referring back to Greek, to the classical world. Uh, you see the students are uh, playing dice under the table. There is a dog waiting for offal from the woman's organs. This is a dynamic environment where people are talking about what this is and what that is. What does that do? What does this do? And this is a highly interactive environment where the students and the teacher interact. And there is the social distance in between the anatomy teacher and the student. It no longer exists like it did in the early Middle Ages. Next slide, please. So this is what he did. What is he doing? He's using Padua the, the, and Pavia, the, the, the background, the country background as the backdrop and he's using uh, a classical pose he's using a greek statue a roman statue uh, and the body is depicted in that way the um, the def definition of the anatomy is superb and jan de kakara's uh, drawings are absolutely outstanding these are not these are done on wood blocks so what what Kalkar does is, is he does draws it on paper then transfers it to a wood block and then the wood block is sent to the printer and the printer puts ink on it and it's pressed now um Vesalius was a very shrewd guy, and he reckoned that if he did the printing in Bologna or Pavia, somebody, people would just uh, steal these printings. So he sent it over uh, to, to Oprinus. Oprinus was a friend of his in Baal in Switzerland. Now, Venice and Switzerland, uh, Venice and uh, Baal, were the great centers of printing in the Renaissance period. So a whole topic I could discuss at some stage next year would be the, on the history of printing. And the big centers of printing in the Renaissance period was Venice. Venice was absolutely miles ahead of any other city in, in Europe at that time when it came to printing. Why? Because um, uh, you had a big influx of Greek intellectuals uh, from the fall of um, Byzantium uh, of Constantinople in 1453. They all emigrated to Venice and into, into Pavia, Padua, Bologna, and Greek studies took off. There were professors of Greek appointed. Printing took off. The Greek printing press, which still exists today, is still present in Venice. And this produced books, and books and printing became easier to do, became less expensive, and became fashionable. So we have the onset of printing. We have intellectual development in universities. We have academics like Vesalius revolutionizing ideas in anatomical studies. And we have all of this converging together to create this great advance in anatomical, anatomical representation, as you see in this fabulous book. It is uh, seven or six or 700 pages long. It's an enormous, uh, an enormous uh, book. It um, published in 1543, and there are still some first editions in 
uh, in existence, mostly in Oxford and Cambridge, but not some in America and some, of course, in the Italian university libraries. Next slide, please. And this is another one uh, showing, uh, you know, the vastus lateralis, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Longus, the rectus abdominis, and of course the flexor and extensor muscles of the arm. Now this is a flayed, this is a flayed body he has done. He's taken all the skin away, uh, he's taken all the fat away, and he's micro dissected everything down. And then he can, John de Calcar has come along and he's drawn it, uh, and then it's put onto wood block and then transferred to print. And uh, next one, please. Uh, next. Then he actually goes right down to the bones. And as I said, in um, the bones and cartilage are part of book one. And as you can see, it's written in Latin, of course, it's written in Latin. Humanus corpus osseum is written across the top. And of course, uh, this is uh, the philosophical note in this of man contemplating his own existence with the, looking at the skull. So again, this is not pure anatomy alone. There's a certain amount of philosophy involved and uh, in all of these writings. He um, he continued his, as, as professor of anatomy uh, until uh, uh, well he's put, he, put, he he continued as professor of anatomy for a number of years uh, lay, uh, for for a further couple of years. But what happened then was he was visiting professor uh, at Bologna and he was invited by the students to go to Bologna um, to uh, give a talk and do a dissection. And the professor of anatomy in Bologna at the time was a guy called uh, Carpi Carpi. And they did it intentionally because they knew that Carpi was a Galenist and they knew Vesalius was the opposite. And they got, so all the students got in and they would ask questions and they'd ask questions of Carpi and they'd ask Vesalius the same question. And their questions, of course, would have a different answer. And riots would break out and the students would riot, would basically edge on the two academic professors to, to and Vesalius would get really annoyed. He'd put his scalpel down and just shout at Carpi and so on. These were dynamic environments. It got so heated at one stage that a number of anatomists from Bologna University all walked out when uh, Vesalius said that uh, Galen was, was basically incorrect and they made lots of mistakes. He eventually um, uh, left uh, and became the private physician to uh, Charles V. And even when he was there, a large number of anatomists like Silvius, as in the aqueduct of Silvius in Paris, where he studied, professor of anatomy in Paris was Silvius. He wrote lots of treatises condemning Vesalius' ideas. So there was a huge conflict going on in the Renaissance period about who was correct. To say this left in disgust and eventually died and drowned on his way to pilgrimage in the Holy Land because he was going there to confess his sins because he dissected a Spanish nobleman while he was the heart was still pul pulsing. So he went there to uh, profess his sins and on the way back the ship sank and he died. And that was the end of the series. But his book uh, continues and it is uh, one of the great books uh, from the start of the world of printing the Renaissance period. Next slide, please. Again, this is what, this is what the first edition looks like. Um, the, uh, the, the anatomical uh, uh, representations fill the whole page. Not much text, as you can see. Uh, it is really a book of representation. When we come to look at uh, other books produced later, like Grey's Anatomy, you will see there's a fair amount of text in it, as well as uh, representational uh, representation of the human body. Next slide, please. OK, I'm not going to spend too long on this. We've, I've only got 10 minutes left, but I showed you these last week. Now, why did I put these in here? Simple. These are Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings, and you would think that the impact from Leonardo's drawings would be more than the serious. Unfortunately, of course, uh, the anatomical drawings done by Leonardo da Vinci were not uh, available to the general public or to students at the time. Sure, they're, they're of higher quality, and we know that in those days, both anatomy students and medical students studied the body. It wasn't just uh, confined to just anatomy students and the faculties of medicine. R artists were involved in anatomical dissection themselves. They also were involved in drawing the body to make their art better. Doctors or medical students were to make their medicine better, but they basically were on the same guild in Florence. And um, uh, as I said last week, they probably met in the Apothecary's Hall where the one collected pigment and the other one collected uh, um, basically medicines. Uh, but in 1313, the doctors and the artists in Italy were in the same guild. The students went to anatomical dissections as well, the students of art. And, uh, and th this is uh, uh, one of the other reasons why these anatomical textbooks were, were created, not just for medical students, but also for artists to use as well to make their uh, art better. 
next couple of slides, please. Never. This is uh, the uh, flexor uh, digital flexor uh, Politius longus and flexor digitorum longus and flexor digitum minimi in a dissection done by Leonardo da Vinci. The uh, the definition is absolutely outstanding. Next slide, please. Again, this is another Leonardo representation. Uh, gets it wrong. Uh, this is from the Queen's collection in London. I saw this at the uh, an exhibition two years ago, and um, he leaves a lot of things out. He doesn't. Uh, he hasn't actually identified the superior, the inferior mesen, inferior mesenteric artery. And in the lateral view of this, he shows a connection between the spinal cord and this, the um, the testis, which um, was thought physically exist. So even though he was a good dissector, he had his own pre pre preconceived, preconceived ideas and he forced them onto his drawings. And even though he didn't actually find them uh, uh, in his anatomical dissection. So again, there are inaccuracies present even in Leonardo's drawings. Next slide, please. OK, this uh, again, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to make this a short um, description. If I can just find my yeah, here we are. OK, so so far we have the advances made in the Greek world. Uh, well, Egypt, uh, the Ptolemaic Egypt, which was, of course, Greek culture. We have uh, very little activity for 1400 years. Then we have the Middle Ages with Bernardo de, de Caprio and, 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 and so on, advancing uh, dissection and anatomical studies. Then we have uh, the Renaissance with um, Leonardo da Vinci's drawings, which weren't available, but in particular with Vesalius, who completely revolutionized anatomical studies. But at the same time, as I said, anatomy was used to teach medical students, to teach artists, but as public display. So in um, uh, Bologna and Pisa and Pavia, Pavia was part of the Venetian Empire. So anybody who was under the control of the Senate in Venice, uh, any of the academics worked in the University of Pavia. In those days, Venice did not have its own university, it does have now, it's a beautiful building on the Grand Canal, but they didn't in those days. Uh, and the university for the Venetian territories was in Pavia. So uh, they had to answer to the uh, Venetian Senate. Now, the uh, Bologna and Pavia and this place, this is Bologna. This is the place where the professor of anatomy sat, just almost like an emperor and the dissection occurred below him. He didn't get involved in the actual literature details of working out which artery went where. And he just basically went on about some Aristotle's inversion of the, the, the heavens and so on, completely unrelated to what was going on practically. And Vesalius completely changed that and revolutionized the whole way to teach anatomy. But that is private anatomy. That's anatomy occurring in the university environment. On top of that, we have public anatomy. Public anatomy is where in Carnivale in the winter time, where most dissections were done in the winter because of the temperature. And dissections usually started off with the abdomen, uh, then went on to the thorax, limbs, and brain, and so on. Uh, in those days, they had to do it in winter time. And the dissections occurred in a series of courses uh, provided for the public and medical students. So everybody went to them. Kings came along. And in those days, this idea of the mask in Carnivale still existed. In outside Venice, so you could go as a local magistrate with a mask on to see anatomical dissection in the evening time. So people would uh, make it a social event. You had to buy tickets. There were guards outside. There were candles lit. There was the mask drapings on the walls, and so on. It was a big social event, and people came along. And uh, the whole faculty of medicine, the faculties, so all the faculty members would come along and sit opposite the professor of anatomy, and they would watch the dissection and the anatomical dissection and the academic and philosophical discussions that occurred as well. So, be being Italians and being very proud, uh, they decided to make their anatomy departments, anatomy lecture theatres, and national dissection rooms very flamboyant and very renaissance. As you can see here, you've got two carried figures. You have got, um, if you move, move on Nevin, to the next slide. So this is the uh, view from the faculty, the professors at the end. No, no, go back again, that's Pavia. That's what Pavia looks like. The Bologna is the one I want to concentrate on. So that's what the International Theatre in Pavia in Bologna looks like. It's, it's existed today as it is there, and you can go and visit it. And you can see that's not the type of National Theatre you can get in Galway or in Philadelphia even in the 18th century. This is Italian approach to anatomy. And the professors of anatomy are all the busts along the top, and um, the, the god of medicine is carved on the roof, and the dissection occurred there, and the dissectors were around, and all the academics from the university would sit around. This was a dramatic event, social event. 
and um, uh, it was used to, dis to dissect bodies, to talk about anatomy, but also to talk about ideas that were very prominent in Italian culture at the time, the meaning of life, uh, uh, the, you know, the influence of religion on society, all of these things, highly complex philosophical discussions would take place in that environment. So it wasn't just about, um, uh, about anatomical dissection on its own. Next slide, please. OK, let's go back to the first one. This is John Hunter, the surgeon. Uh, uh, Scott from East Kilbride, William Hunter, his older brother. So the story is as follows. It starts in, uh, we'll have to see on this slide because even though it's about John Hunter. So the, first, the story starts about the Hunter brothers in St. George's Hospital. So St. George's Hospital now is in Tooting, uh, in a particularly horrible part of London. But in those days, it was up in Hyde Park Corner near where Tyburn used to be. And uh, this was all countryside in those days. There was uh, some houses around the area in the countryside. These were country houses, but there was no big uh, building project that has gone on in the last couple of hundred years where everything is overbuilt in London. So in those days, Hyde Park Corner and George's were actually had, if you look out the window at the back of St. George's Hospital in those days, you would see countryside. This particular man and also his brother were both Scottish physicians working in London, John and William Hunter. And more, no more than uh, Vesalius, they contributed enormously to anatomical studies. And Vesalius was the engine for change. And these guys were the sports model. They really came on and revolutionized how you actually do dissection, how you actually preserve the specimens, how you teach it. So in those days, there were medical schools around, but there were a large number of students. And the students didn't have enough anatomical uh, access to anatomical um, uh, specimens. So there were something like 20 private schools in London, of which the most famous in, Win in Windmill Street were the Hunter ones. So William Hunter came down from London, from Glasgow, from East, East from Ayrshire, and he was 10 years older than his brother, and he became an acuteur with an acuteur and an apothecary. So an acuteur is a midwife, and then he worked with uh, uh, a very famous um, uh, obstetrician at the time called Smelly, who developed the Smelly's uh, forceps for delivery. And that was in 17, 1740. John comes down uh, 10 years later. Uh, I begin, John comes down uh, 1748, uh, eight years later, but it's the 10 years between the two of them. Now, in those days, medicine, the, the, this is George in England. This is the time of George the Third and Queen Charlotte. They had no uh, advanced or uh, proven for ways of treating patients. The only thing they had was, for example, they had uh, chinchona bark from Peru, from brought over by the Jesuits. Um, and Lady, um, uh, Lady, Mary Mon Mon Lady Mary Montague, the wife of the British ambassador Constantinople in 1721, saw folk remedies for smallpox and inoculated all her own children with small quantities of the pus to make them, uh, to give them immunize, immunize, to immunize them against smallpox. And most of the medical services provided in those days were provided by quacks. So into that environment come these two great men. In 1540, the company of barber surgeons was founded and they had the right to four bodies. And the four bodies were in Tyburn. They were held in Newgate prison and then marched to Tyburn on a, the back of, a, back of a cart with a horse, drawn by a horse, and hanged at Tyburn, which is that where Barber Arch is now. And the journey was three miles. And along the way, they would stop at inns and get the poor criminal uh, inebriated, and they would subsequently be hung. And then all head would break loose. So the, the Beagers and the Hunter, John Hunter in particular, would be there to try and grab the body, as, as would the medical students, because there were just so few medical students, uh, so few bodies around to dissect. So William Hunter got this idea, being a Kenny old Scot, he opened his own private medical school. Two terms, 5 to 7 to 30, 5 to 7 30 in the evening. And then he gets John to come down, and John is poorly educated. He, um, his father had died, a lost his siblings had died, he had no skills, he was going to join the army. He left school early, he was semi-literate. He came down and William got him to start doing dissections. And over the next 10 years, eight, 10 years, he dissects everything that moves, animals, elephants, he gets his hands on absolutely everything. And he does comparative anatomy to parex lots. He then gets educated as a surgeon and does his surgical exams William, interestingly enough, did his exams too and did his MBBCH, but he actually, being a snob and a very, very rich man in the end, uh, becomes a physician and joins the College of Physicians and reneges his uh, membership of the Barber Surgeons. John is different. Go on to the next slide, uh, uh, please. John is different. So why, what's William's, what was William's um, contribution to medical, medical knowledge? He was an obstetrician. He was the obstetrician to Queen Charlotte. 
he was obsessed by getting representations of the fetus, which was impossible to get in those days. So luckily in, in um, 1785, 17, uh, 1780, 1781, two, three, four, those four years in sequence, a number of women who were executed at different stages of pregnancy were brought in by John. John was a great scavenger. He used to frequent the pubs and the bit taverns with his medical students. He swore like a sailor. He was very uncouth, didn't put a wig on like his brother, but he was a canny old Scot and he would go around stealing bodies of all the churches around Covent Garden where their anatomy school was and he would get bodies back. Eventually, William managed to get enough bodies of pregnant women to dissect the uterus out and uh, and to show the baby. And this again is um, a, a, a drawing done not by William and John uh, Hunter, but by a man called Van Rijstek. Now, no more than Carter with Gray's Anatomy, no more than Calcar with Vesalius, it's the anatomical drawings that are really the attraction. And, and, and the artists who do all of these don't get any, as a matter of fact, in Gray's Anatomy, Carter is never mentioned in his contribution to get Gray's Anatomy. But this man is, Van Rijsdijk does all these beautiful anatomical drawings. Next slide, please, uh, Nevin. Next slide. And these are the fetuses that John Hunter put together uh, of the different uh, stages of pregnancy that were from women who were executed for uh, crimes. The crimes can be last summer very, not necessarily very serious, but these are up on the Hunter's Museum in, 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 in Glasgow. Next slide, please. Nevin, next slide. So, but yeah, we'll have to skip that. This shows you how crude things were in uh, the, in, in Georgia and England. They were very good. No anaesthetic talking about, we gave them loud them some whiskey and so on. And they were very crude. What was John's big um, uh, in, uh, impact in Georgia's? Okay, he did anatomy, became a surgeon, joined Georgia's, was hated by his colleagues, was hated by Pot, who was over at Bart's. But this is a lovely story about him. He sees a, in 1785, he was so hated in Georgia that his colleagues wouldn't even talk to him. He was a very eminent man. But people came from America and Europe to study with him. In 1785, John Hunter was looking at a hackney coach driver with a painful swelling behind his right knee, which he'd been there for three years. He diagnosed a popliteal artery aneurysm, a common problem in coach drivers because they had high boots and they were they flexed knees for a lot of their time while working. Hunter uh, was hated and he had conversations with Posh and, and a lot of the other uh, surgeons who studied anatomy as well and were actually practicing surgeons in other hospitals. And the consensus at the time was that if you had a popliteal artery aneurysm, the cure was above knee amputation. Um, uh, and, pot, uh, uh, and Percival Posh, who describes pot fractures of the ankle, of course, uh, suggested that that is the only way to do it. But poor old Hunter was a very adventurous man. And he decided, I have tried it before and I'm going to like it. So he had like it before the patient died. So he had another shot at it. And on Christmas Eve, on the 12th of December, 1785, the patient went to the theatre, was held down by some of um, uh, John Hunter's ascent assistants. And he put a six inch incision behind the knee, the patient held down and isolated the aneurysm. But he was very, very intelligent man. He didn't put a, lig a ligature above and below so that the popliteal artery would have high pressure and it would burst. He put four ligatures of different tightness above and below the aneurysm. Uh, the one the furthest away was not so tight, the one further down was tighter and vice versa down the below the uh, the, uh, the popular artery aneurysm. The next day, the man was out of pain. He went home in January 1786, cured of his popular artery aneurysm and died in 1787. Now, what do you think John Hunter did? He shot across London, dissected the man and got his leg, which is in the Hunter Museum, to see whether an astomatic channel had opened up around the knee. Because he said, we can ligate the uh, popliteal artery because you get genicular anastomosis growing and the leg will not be lost. And he actually went to the trouble of getting the man's knee to prove that the genicular anastomosis preserved the man's foot and his leg. Okay, I think I have to stop there. I want to move on just to show you the end. Uh, move on, Nevin, and just, I apologize to all of you. The, I said to you, it's a huge topic. There's lots more, but I think that's the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. This is Harvey. And uh, this is Gray's Anatomy, uh, which I would love to have told you about. Gray and Carter. This is Gray's Anatomy, and so on. This is next one. Keep going, Nevin. Nevin next one, Nevin, please. Uh, dissection in America, a, a whole lecture on its own. Keep going. Whole lecture on its own. Uh, I think we'll just look at the pictures. It's, uh, next one again. This is in 
Uh, first dissection done by women, in, and this is dissection table. And, uh, next one again. This is uh, the European Journal of Anatomy, which I've read recently. 600 pound subscription a year, but it's wonderful. I'd love to buy a get a subscription two days ago. This is where anatomy has evolved to in the 21st century. Next one. Uh, a whole story behind that skull. This is John Knox and, of course, grave robbing and uh, the body snatchers. The resurrection men, as Dickens describes them in Oliver Twist, Bork and Hare. Next one. Uh, this is Knox's burial site. This is Burke and Hare, both Ulster men, Irish men over living in Glasgow, who killed 16 people and sold to Knox. Next one. Uh, this is the and uh, the execution of um, uh, Burke was there, and that's his skeleton in, I think it's in Glasgow. Uh, may well be in one of the hospitals, probably in the university. Next one. Next one, this is Greyfriars uh, Churchyard in Edinburgh. I want to show you something very interesting from it. Uh, these are grids put down to go back again. Uh, go back again, go back again, go back again. These are grids put down to stop grave robbers from stealing from, uh, stealing from graves. Go back again. Um, uh, I want to show the audience one more slide. That's it, okay. This is, uh, I have to show you this because this is really interesting. Bernard, Bernard, Sir Bernard um, uh, Spilbury was the uh, first man in England to be a forensic pathologist. And uh, he went to Magdalen College in Oxford. He came from Leamington Spa and came down to London and he worked at St. Mary's and he was a, uh, the first forensic coroner, uh, forensic pathologist at, of the time. Um, when I did an MSc in, uh, an MA in, in History of Medicine at the Institute of, um, at uh, the Wellcome Institute of uh, History of Medicine at Houston Square, or off Cross from Houston, uh, railway station. The first day we were all there, there were only eight of us in the group, uh, the curator of the museum took us around and he was talking around showing all the wonderful books. It's a <coughs> pain in the neck library because you can't borrow any of the books. It's absolutely brilliant library but you can't borrow anything and it's really quite useless because you can't take text home and photocopy. Uh, and they won't let you photocopy more than so much in the library. So it's really pretty pointless but it's a wonderful collection. Anyway, we're wandering along the corridor and I saw these boxes on the wall and I said to the curator, what is in those boxes? Oh, he said, they are PM reports done by Bernard Spilbury, who lived between 1877 and 1947, and he was a forensic pathologist, and he documented all his pathology, all his uh, forensic postmortems in in little uh, pieces of um, cardboard paper like that, and put them into boxes. And then I said, can I have a look? So he, he opened them up and gave me these, and I got, uh, him to, I got a photograph of them. I want you to look at number five. Uh, to give you an example of the story. So the story is, this is a young girl who goes into Harrods, so the post-mortem is done in Kensington. She goes into Harrods, and her name is Helen Elspeth Dalyramp. She's 26, and she's 29, and she's female. She goes in, and she has a new dry shampoo, new form of shampoo applied in the ladies' department in Harrods' shop at the time. She turns, uh, she, the, the halfway through the, the shampooing and putting dye into her hair or some sort of uh, colouring, and she has a cardiac arrest and dies. So the accusation is that the, uh, there was carbon tetrachloride in the preparation and that poisoned her and that she died. And he came along and did the post-mortem. And actually the post-mortem result, which you can't quite see, is below it. The, you can see the heart on the left shows petechiae. This lady, young lady, had a dilated cardiomyopathy and she most unlikely died from cardiac arrhythmia. So this collection of uh, Bernard Spilbury's post-mortem reports are in the Wellcome Institute and nobody's done a PhD on it, nobody's done any type of research and it would be a wonderful topic to attack at some stage when I've retired. Next up, next slide, please. So I think that's the most of the, this is, okay. One last point I'd like to make. This, I did a course on uh, anatomy applied to arts a number of years ago at the Prince's Trust. Now, I wasn't by any means any good at it, but there were a large number of artists there, and this is not from that particular uh, two-week study, but this was the type of stuff some of the artists, art students from, um, from St. Martin's in the Martin's uh, School in London. St. Martin's uh, Art School is very famous, and during the summer, the students go off to drawing classes and, and uh, anatomy studies as part of their course. Uh, so I went along as well, didn't pretend I wasn't an art student, and of course I was not by far the worst student there, but I enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Two weeks of drawing bodies. This is the type of stuff some of these students could do. Mavid, can we see some of them, please? 
that would be the type of stuff that we we did. Wonderful. Uh, my stuff was a bit like that, not quite as good as that. Next one. Again, that would be more like the type of stuff with charcoal I would be able to do. I was able to do. Next one. So the point of the whole talk, and that's one I've done in uh, with uh, uh, a very metal stylus. It's a wonderful way of doing it. Classic report. Next one. And this is what, uh, go back again, go back again. So that's the talk. And um, so let me summarize. So we have looked in uh, to some extent and cherry picked and micro historically approached anatomical studies for 2,500 years. An impossible task to do in one, in one lecture. We looked at what happened in Ptolemaic Egypt. We looked at in the Middle Ages. We came to Vesalius. We got as far as the Hunter brothers, but we didn't see Gray's Anatomy. We didn't see what happened in America. And, and I apologize for that, but I did this as succinctly as I could. This is what we are at now, the 21st century computer generated representation of the blood supply of the brain. This is wonderful anatomy to look at. That's the talk. I'm going to finish it off as I always do with a great reverence to Irish writers of which we have six Nobel Prize winners for a small country. And I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures. Go back, go back, go back. No, go back. So the first one is James Joyce. James Joyce, why did it go back Nevin to James Joyce, please? James Joyce, believe it or not, was a medical student. Uh, I tried to look up his history. There is some, go back to James Joyce, Nevin, please, the man. James Joyce was certainly a medical student, the previous one to that again. James Joyce was a medical student, certainly in Paris. Uh, and um, this, he left after a couple of weeks. Thank God he didn't get an education to become a doctor. He would never have been a great writer. He would have destroyed any creativity the man possessed. This is when he lived in Trieste. And this is the family, that's Giorgio uh, Lucia, who is schizophrenic, and um, uh, his wife, uh, Nora Barnick, who's from Galway. The interesting thing about uh, Joyce, his daughter, she was uh, psychoanalyzed by Freud, by, by, not by Freud, by Jung, Carl Jung, a very famous psychoanalyst, who also read Ulysses, and he said, not only was she a schizophrenic, but so was Joyce. Joyce was also mad as well, according to Jung. Next slide, please. Uh, mm. And at Christmas time, when I was at home, I went to see Norda Barnacle's house, which is across from St. Nicholas's Cathedral. So if Kevin is here, that's that's uh, open to the visitors, Kevin, in um, Galway. I brought my mum along. That's upstairs in Norda Barnacle's house in Galway. Next slide, please. This is our wonderful uh, Edna O'Brien, great Irish writer. <sighs> Fantastic looking woman in her day. She's written two books recently called Nora, George, George, called uh, James and Nora about their marriage and one on Joyce. She's a wonderful writer. I have my mother reading Country Girls at the moment by her. Um, she lives in London, of course, now in her 80s, but is still very articulate. I saw her interviewed in RT recently about her last book. Very articulate, intelligent woman. Next one. And this is uh, my um, favourite poet, other than, uh, well, not, well, my favourite poet, other than, than Yeats. This is um, Martin Corbley's uh, countryman, um, Patrick Kavanagh, school teacher in Dublin, a great, great mind. Uh, and written some beautiful poetry, which I learned in school, never appreciated until I got a bit older. Next slide, please. He wrote, his most famous one uh, is Raglan Road, which he gave to Luke Kelly uh, as a present in a pub one night in Dublin. And the base of Luke of Raglan Road, next slide, please, is Hilda mm -hmm. Mulliarity. This girl is going to see next. Next one again. This is his um, recollection of the visit to, this is the girl. So this is the basis of the long-haired lady, the black-haired lady that, um, uh, that uh, Kavanagh describes in his poems, in his poem of Rag and Roll. He, um, she was a medical student in Dublin. Um, they met in 1944, just before the war finished. His father's a GP in Tralee. And uh, poor old Kavanagh was 38 and she was 20. And um, he was mad about her and uh, he reckoned though it would never go anywhere. He brought her, she brought him down to Christmas on Christmas in 1944 five, I think, to see to meet her father, and he was disgusted that her daughter was going to marry such an Irishman, but he turned out to be a very eminent Irishman at the end of it all. Uh, and the next year, in 1946 47, uh, she broke off with poor old Kavanagh, and he wrote Raglan Road. Thank God he um, was upset over it. We would have such beautiful, such beautiful song if uh, it didn't happen. Next slide, Nevin, please. And um, she then subsequently mm -hmm. married this man, Desi O'Malley, and that's her obviously in her 40s with a fur coat. Uh, and Desi Mario was a minister of education in Ireland, Fianna Fáil government, and he brought in free education to Ireland, one of the best things that ever happened to Irish. 
society. Next slide, please. But um, it was very disappointing that um, she didn't marry him. Uh, Brendan Behan, I love. Uh, this is him down at Connemara. Uh, Behan was in a description of Behan I saw recently was he was a, he was a, an IRA man. He went over to Liverpool with a bag. I got off and met a, somebody. Go back, go back, Nevin. He met somebody at the um, customs in those days, or the place people got off from the boat with a bag. And the guy, uh, the policeman, said to him, "Mr. Behan, what's in the bag?" "Oh, nothing much. Just me shaving stuff and so on." He opens the bag. He ten, ten sticks of dynamite in it to blow up Liverpool. He was arrested and went to jail, and that's where his education started. But he was described. He said himself, "I am a writer with. I am a." a, a Drinker with a with a writing problem, and he he's a bitchery. Uh, and his description in in uh, article I saw recently was a womanizer, bomber, IRA member, alcoholic, uh, troublemaker. He's he's a bitchery, but is to be envied. A wonderful Irish writer. Next one, please. This is Galway at the turn of the century, and you can see the tram that goes out to Salt Hill. Alexander Moon's shop is still there, and that's uh, Martin Corbett's country line country line carried across County Man in the turn of the century as well. Martin, I don't know where all the ladders are for. It's probably the men scaping out the top window when they're having illicit affairs. I don't know, but they're certainly not the thing you see in Galway. <laughs> and the last one, I have to say, the last one is my favourite. Uh, we all have our favourite patients. Martin has. We all have after a lifetime of being a doctor. Unfortunately, mine. these are my next door neighbours in Galway. Uh, this is herd behaviour you see in all cattle and animals that are in a herd. They behave like this one they see uh, somebody coming along. Anyway, my last picture is my favourite patient. It is actually a paediatric patient and he's been examined by a paediatrician for his chest. It's a lowland gorilla from the Congo and the poor old paediatrician hasn't worn his stethoscope. And I think the poor old, uh, the poor old uh, ape, um, gorilla's reaction is wonderful. This is, uh, I love, I love these, these, I love animals. Last thing is the creme de la creme of the whole talk. So um, Nevin, take it away. This is Luke Kelly. On Raglan Road of an autumn day, I saw her first and knew that her dark hair would weave a snare. That I might one day rule. I saw the danger and I passed along the enchanted way. And I said, Let grief be a fallen leaf. At the dawning of on Grafton Street in November, we tripped lightly along the ledge of a deep ravine where can be seen. The worth of passion's pledge The queen of hearts still making tarts And I'm not making hay Oh, I love too much And by such, by such is happiness thrown away? I gave her gifts out of the mind. I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists who have known. The true gods of. Thank you very much, John, for a fantastic run through anatomy. Uh, I'm going to. I have one question I'd like to ask after Professor Fox has moderated some Q's and A's. Thank you very much, John. I have one question to ask uh, after um, Professor Fox has moderated the Q's and A's. 
And we'll come okay. back to you then. I know that people probably want to get away. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. turn you over to Professor Fox. Okay. <laughs> okay. John, that was fantastic. That's from a dub now, a dub now who I've uh, sort of spent most of my life living around Raglan Road. Um, essentially, well done, well done. Listen, can, can I just make a point? The, 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 there is no English poet who could write on quiet streets where all ghosts meet. I saw her walking there. That is just wonderful. No, no, great, great time. Listen, just we are stuck for time, and I'm okay. just waiting for questions to come in. If you want to pick a favourite anatomist, who is your favourite anatomist? Well, I think the one who's had the most uh, impact visually has to be uh, the Hunter brothers. But I, because, I mean, they have, I just loved, when I was an undergraduate in Goa, I used to love pathology. And even when I was in, in Barts teaching, the Robin Brooks Centre has got the old pathology uh, specimens there going right back to pot and the statue of pot there. And there's just something wonderful about the physical body to dissect as a medical student and the pathology specimens. This is what makes us doctors. We're not engineers, we're not scientists. We okay. treat the flesh. We treat the flesh, um, uh, and I think that it, uh, I think the same would apply to veterinary anatomy as well. I just love, and uh, it's just my just my great love of, of the visual. You know, um, I like text as well, but I love, you know, one of my, one of my most favourite occupation is actually drawing the naked body in an anatomy in, in an art class. I just find it so uh, consoling and mentally and physically. It's just wonderful and. Um, I think uh, the Hunter brothers probably from that point of view, but Vesalius' work was revolutionary. I mean, he completely changed the whole ethos of and uh, of uh, anatomical uh, studies in one very short lifetime. He died when he was only 46, and he was hated no more mm -hmm. than the Hunter brothers. Uh, they were these people who were demonised, hated by their colleagues, and they did wonderful things for our <laughs> our profession. Okay, and Gray's anatomy. The whole book, story, book, book, a whole story on its own. The only important thing about Gray's Anatomy is how nasty Henry Gray was, because the beauty of Gray's Anatomy are the anatomical drawings, and they were done by Carter. And he completely, there's, there's, I actually have a picture of Gray's Anatomy with Carter's name at the bottom of it and Gray's name at the top. And Gray's name is Le Lecturer in Anatomy at St. George's, and Carter's name is Professor of Anatomy at uh, Grant School in, in, in Mumbai, in New Delhi. And he was appointed there just as the book was published. And when his back was turned, Gray came along and eroded any record of Carter's contribution to Gray's Anatomy. And the great thing about Gray's Anatomy are the drawings. They're, they're drawings done in pencil and then sure. coloured as appropriate. They're wonderful. Fantastic, fantastic. I'll hand you, I'll hand you back to Martin. Hand okay, Martin, back. sorry. Thank you very much, John. Nevin, can you put up the time, the schedule for the upcoming events, please, as we, as I asked on the last question. Um, John, you recently uh, gave me a fantastic book, which I finished, which is called The Butchery Art. Yeah, yeah. And I must say, I'm so impressed with the resilience of Lister, uh, how he plodded right through until he got the answer to his question. But at the same time, I was, I was struck by the profoundly negative effect that anatomy had on uh, surgical wounds at the time. As you know, surgeons in the mid 1850s and so forth, they tended not to go into the abdomen or chest, but they stayed peripherally knee joints, uh, yeah. amputations, draining abscesses. And their concept of infection was completely alien to what we understand by infection today. But uh, Lister, despite his critics, persisted and followed his idea of the causes of um, infection has been microbial until he finally uh, discovered Pasteur, Pasteur and his principles and of course yeah, that yeah. changed the way we think about wounds. But prior to that, medical students used to leave the anatomy, the section halls, which and as you say were, were a spectacle and people from outside could walk in, it was like going to the movies. Yes, exactly. You walked in exactly. and you had a spectacle of anatomy and of course they brought incredible infections to the wards. So. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that era of, of anatomical dissection? Well, I, 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 I think that uh, what's common between all of these, I won't answer the question directly first, I'll just make this comment. What's, what's common between all of these people, like Vesalius, the Hunter brothers and Nistra, what's common between all of these is a belief in themselves against all the opposition and, and, and vilification by their colleagues. And I think it still happens to this day. The medical environment in the NHS in England has to be the most 
uh, appalling experience of my whole existence. And it, when I went to Galway, it completely changed. And it's even wonderful here. And I think when you have that type of work environment, which goes right back to Abernathy. Abernathy was a surgeon in Bars, and it got so it got so bad in Bars in the 18th century that the, the House of Parliament debated whether to close St. Bartholomew's Hospital because of Abernathy's behaviour. And that, that behaviour still exists in medicine. And it's the fact that medics are a jealous lot, no more than scientists are. And I think that when we reckon that the maverick in our society should be glorified, the individual that stands out from the crowd and says, actually, the world is flat or the world is a square. OK, this is where academic discussion and everything is so wonderful to hear. I heard Norm Chomsky in Oxford many years ago when I was in Oxford. And it's people like Chomsky and, and Fauci in America, the, the guy that vilified by that thug called Trump, Trump. It's people like them that make society, that create the advances in society and make them better places. And Lister as well has to be a celebration I, for what he did. I think we have, we have to cut short, but just to, to invite our, 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 our audience today to attend next week and perhaps invite some friends along. We have a we have a, a wonderful talk ahead uh, with Professor Fox uh, on cholera, and we have some very interesting talks com coming up again. And of course, uh, Professor Flood will feature again twice in the upcoming series. And I encourage you all to to come along to to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, Professor Flood, it's a great pleasure uh, to Thanks. thank you on behalf of everyone in attendance. Uh, for your passionate uh, uh, analysis of anatomy and its importance in, in medicine and, and in fact uh, to mankind. Th thank you very much indeed and, and everyone stay safe. Thanks a lot. And before I go, can I of course thank Fauzia, uh, Nevin and Victoria for their uh, patient help in, in all of our efforts to, to, to stay online. Thank you very much. Uh, bye Thanks, now. Sir.